We're now going to look closer at the process of vaporization. When a liquid is placed in a container that has been evacuated, the space over the liquid is initially empty of any gas. However, there are particles on the surface of the liquid that has enough kinetic energy to escape the intermolecular attractions of the rest of the liquid state. These particles then travel to the empty space and exist in the gas phase. Now as more liquid particles escape, some in the gas phase would start to recondense back into the liquid state. Eventually, the rate of liquid particles escaping into the gas phase is equal to the rate of the gas particles recondensing, and the system reaches what we call a physical equilibrium. At that point, the amount of gas particles over the liquid remains constant over time. The pressure of the vapor over the liquid can be measured as a function of time, which is shown here. As I just explained, at the beginning there's an increase in the quantity of gas, and at some point in time that quantity reaches a plateau. The pressure of the vapor when physical equilibrium is reached is what we call the vapor pressure of the liquid. There are two factors that determine how high the vapor pressure of a liquid will be. The first factor is the temperature of the liquid. You you may recall this observation when we discuss gas particles where higher temperature results in higher kinetic energy. For liquids at higher temperature, the average kinetic energy will also be higher and therefore it will be easier for these particles to escape the intermolecular forces holding them to the liquid state. You can see this when vapor pressure is plotted as a function of temperature. The vapor pressure increases exponentially as the temperature increases. This is true for all liquids as shown here. Now the second factor that affects vapor pressure is the strength of the intermolecular forces that holds the liquid state. It would make sense that if the IMF is weaker then it will be easier for the liquid to escape and become gas which makes the vapor pressure higher. In this same plot we see three different liquids diethyl ether, ethanol, and water. The structures of these species is shown down here. Diethyl ether can only use dipole-dipole interactions. Ethanol can make one hydrogen bond while water can make two hydrogen bonds. As a result, the strength of the IMF increases going from diethyl ether to hydrogen bond to water. Now this is observed in the vapor pressure plot as well. For example, at a given temperature, let's say 20 degrees, if we look up to where that line intersects with the vapor pressure line of each liquid, we see that water has the lowest vapor pressure followed by ethanol and diethyl ether has the highest vapor pressure at that given temperature. And again, the reason is because the intermolecular force holding diethyl ether together is the weakest, so it's the easiest for the diethyl ether liquids to escape and form vapor. Vapor pressure is an important concept to understand because it directly correlates to the boiling point of a liquid. From your own experience, you know that boiling occurs when we see bubbles coming out of the liquid. It turns out that this can only happen at a specific condition. That condition is when the vapor pressure of the liquid is equal to the atmospheric pressure. So this figure here illustrates the process of boiling for water. At 25 Celsius, the vapor pressure of water is much smaller compared to the atmospheric pressure. So any bubbles that's generated by the liquid turning into gas is instantaneously squashed by the higher pressure of the atmosphere. At 70 degrees, the vapor is higher, but the atmospheric pressure is still greater than the vapor pressure. So no bubbles are observed. Once we hit 100 degrees Celsius, the vapor pressure of water is equal to the atmospheric pressure. And at that point, the bubbles of vapor are observed and we say the liquid is boiling. The boiling point of a liquid is defined as the temperature at which the vapor pressure of the liquid is equal to the atmospheric pressure. If the atmospheric pressure is one atmosphere, this temperature is called the normal boiling point. So for water, the normal boiling point is 100 degrees. Now water can boil at lower temperature if the atmospheric pressure is lower. This is shown on the following table where the boiling point of water progressively decreases at higher altitudes. This is because the amount of air in the atmosphere is less in the higher altitude resulting in a lower atmospheric pressure. So it will 
take a lower temperature to equal that atmospheric pressure. The melting point is the temperature at which a solid becomes a liquid and is similarly affected by the strength of the intermolecular forces. The stronger the IMF, the higher the solid's melting point. For example, ice melts at zero Celsius, but solid ethanol melts at negative 114 degrees Celsius. The plot of vapor pressure as a function of temperature that I show here can be fitted using an exponential equation to generate a formula for relating vapor pressure to temperature. This equation is called the clausius clapeyron equation, which allows us to calculate vapor pressure as a function of both temperature and the enthalpy of vaporization. And the enthalpy of vaporization is important because that's a measure of the intermolecular forces that exist in the liquid state. So we just talked about the clausius clapeyron equation, which we can use to help calculate the vapor pressure of a liquid at two different temperatures, assuming we know the delta H of vaporization. So the equation itself is given here. And this question asks us to use that equation because it gives us a pressure at a certain temperature and then gives us the delta H VAP. And then it also gives us the pressure at another temperature and it's asking us for that second temperature. The way you can solve this is just by using your clausius clapeyron equation. And the first thing is just to rearrange that equation. What I did here was to take that portion of the equation negative delta H VAP over R and bring it down here so that it becomes the denominator. And so I have this expression now. And then once I have that, then on the right side, I should have one over T2 minus one over T1. And I take that one over T1 because it's negative. When I move it to the other side, it becomes a positive. So that's where that comes from. And that whole thing should equal to one over T2. The next thing I need to do is just plug in the numbers that I've marked there with this one being my pressure one, this one being my temperature one, and this one being my pressure two. So I plug in those numbers in there. Another thing to note is I change the unit. And the reason is because the gas constant has a unit of joules as well. And that would allow me to cancel those two units with each other. Same thing with the moles here and the torus as well. So the Kelvin is the only thing that's left at the bottom. And if you were to calculate this out, this is a natural log. So you're going to need to find that key in your calculator to do this. First, you would calculate the ratio and then you can calculate the natural log of the ratio. At the bottom, I just have a negative 38,600 divided by 8.314. That should give me negative 46,42. Now you might say, where's that negative come from? It was originally there in the clausius clapeyron equation. So I'm going to keep that around when I transfer it to the left side. On the right side, I have the temperature, which is given in Celsius. I'm going to have to add 273 to convert it to Kelvin. So I'm going to have this as the other component that I have to add. So once I add this fraction with that fraction, I would get this number right here, 0 0.00284707 as 1 over T2. And then to get T2, I will take 1 over that number, which gives me 352 roughly Kelvin. Subtract 273 out of that will give me the Celsius temperature. So that will be 79.0 Celsius. The information about how a substance changes its phase as a function of pressure and temperature is given by something we call a phase diagram. A standard phase diagram for carbon dioxide is shown here with pressure as the y-axis and temperature as the x-axis. The three different states is easy to determine. At high pressure and low temperature, we would expect a very compressed and ordered state, which is the solid, whereas at low pressure and high temperature, we would expect a very expanded and disordered state, which is gas. In between would be the liquid. A few components of the phase diagram is highlighted here. Each line represents a pressure-temperature combination that results in the existence of two phases. For example, the line here shows the pressure temperature values that will keep both the liquid and gas states of CO2 coexisting in equilibrium. The triple point is the pressure temperature combination that allows all three states to coexist. For CO2, this is at negative 57.5 degrees Celsius and 5.1 atmosphere of pressure. The critical point is a pressure temperature combination where beyond that value, a phase called supercritical liquid exists. This phase is not a liquid or a gas, but incorporates features of both in one phase. It can expand and contract like a gas, but can also serve as solvents. One important use for supercritical CO2 is as a solvent in extraction of various organic compounds like caffeine and essential oils. Now on the right here is the phase diagram for water. It's different than the one for CO2, which is a more typical phase diagram. The reason is that for water, when you increase pressure, water becomes a 
liquid. A typical substance would turn into a solid when you increase pressure. In other words, liquid water is actually more dense than solid water, which is ice. This becomes important in biology because frozen surfaces of lakes can still contain liquid water underneath as the pressure increases. This allows living organisms that rely on liquid water to survive even when the surface temperature is lower than the freezing point of water. We just talked about phase diagram, so I want to highlight a way for you to use phase diagram in an example that's shown here. It says that you want to use the phase diagram that's given to you, which is the one shown here for carbon, and figure out what changes in state occurs as you go from different pressures and different temperatures. So the first one is going from 1000 Kelvin to 5000 Kelvin at constant pressure. So we're starting at 99 ATM, and this corresponds to that yellow line that I've put there, because that's about 100 ATM, or 100 bar, which is around 99 ATM. And we're just going to go across from 1000 to 5000. And so you can see what happens is that corresponds to those two points A and B there. And what happens there is just the carbon will go from solid to gas, right? And then the second portion of this asks for what will happen if you take that same sample and then compress it at 5000 Kelvin all the way from 100 or 99 ATM to about 990,000 ATM. So you really put high pressure on that thing, right? Now, if you take it and put it to really high pressure, what's going to happen? That corresponds to that blue line there. So I start with a gas form of carbon, and then I would pass through the liquid form, but 990,000 ATM is pretty close to a million bar right here, okay? So really, you're talking about compressing it all the way to this point right here, and at that point, you're going to make diamond, which is a solid carbon crystal. So in fact, you're going to change gaseous carbon to liquid and then to solid carbon in the form of a diamond. And in fact, this is what people do when they make artificial diamonds is they first increase the temperature to very high values and then they increase the pressure to very high values.